All right, Nancy, are you there? I sure am. Wonderful. Let's see what we've got here. We got our VP, we got Soup Lee. Recording in progress. And we're missing one supervisor now. There's Supervisor Simidian. We just need Supervisor Chavez. And when she arrives, Nancy, if you'll take a roll call vote, please. Excuse oh. me, if you'll take a, an attendance roll. Just to confirm we're all here. And there she is. Nancy, go right ahead. Supervisor Lee. Be present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. Here. President Wasserman. I'm here as well. And apparently Caltrans is doing work on 17, very close to Los Gatos. Supervisor Simidian, you should look into that. All right. Item 14 is a referral by Supervisors Chavez and Lee. Please take it away, Supervisor Chavez. Great, thank you so much. And I wanna start by thanking Supervisor Lee for joining me on this referral. Um, this is a request to administration to extend the current contract for Viet to Tay through the end of the current fiscal year and to bring this back to the budget process for options for consideration and continued funding through 2023. Um, colleagues, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and just share kind of the challenge we're having here with this program. Um, in 2017, uh, Via Tutte began serving hot meals to approximately 300 clients a day. A recent staff assessment re uh, revealed that these are unduplicated clients not receiving nutrition uh, from any other site. And here's what's really important about this. If you'll recall, originally we were going to transition everybody who was getting meals at Via Tutte to move over to the VASC. Um, in the, and actually the pro programs are pretty close together. However, the VASC Senior Nutrition Program is operating at a maximum capacity of 500 meals per day, six days a week, with 1,600 clients registered for the program, and they have a daily wait list for meals today. Um, therefore, transitioning the 300 additional clients to the VASC will be impossible. The nearest other location is a senior nutrition program located at Seven Trees that serves between 100 and 150 meals per day, and they can't absorb the other 300 clients. Viet Tutte operates a unique Vietnamese-focused vegan meal program to seniors and adult dependents who have found comfort not just in the food, but also in the location. So ending the program now will exacerbate the problem that we're just trying to alleviate with the introduction of the new meal programs that are culturally responsive, nutritious, and delivered in a language accessible and culturally appropriate manner. Um, I hope my colleagues will join Supervisor Lee and I in supporting food accessibility to the most vulnerable seniors in our community. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. And Supervisor Lee, did you wish to add any comments? Yes, sure. I'll be happy to uh, support. So first of all, I thank uh, Supervisor Chavez for putting forth this uh, important um, referral. Uh, as we know, the language barrier, isolation, depression are the biggest issues among the Vietnamese American community. And the programs like Viet Tu Te uh, Senior Nutrition Program is very much needed in our community, especially uh, during these uh, uh, pandemic times. As you have heard from Supervisor Chavez has noted, that the other senior nutrition program in the area cannot absorb the clients served by the Vitute program. And Vitute has successfully served seniors through the senior nutrition program in the area by providing safe and healthy environment for seniors to basically step out of their homes, take the bus, walk to the site, meet friends, eat healthy food and enjoy the day. Senior residents are looking forward to the county to continue supporting this great program. So I certainly urge my colleagues to support as well. Thank you. Thank you. We have no members of the public wishing to speak. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Oh, now we have two members of the public. Nancy, let's let let's let them in for uh, two minutes each. Okay. Our first speaker is Heidi Owens. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. That was a mistake. Sorry. No problem. Next okay. speaker. Our next speaker is Administrator. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Okay. 
and you have been muted, you may begin. Administrator? Nope, let's go to the next speaker. That concludes our public comment. Okay, thank you very much. We have a motion, we have a second. Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. It just amazes me as we go down this this agenda and we just keep coming up with the money for these things. It's just, it's amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, item 16 is a referral by supervisors Simidian and Chavez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think the um, referral uh, clarifies the request and the need sufficiently uh, I want to thank Supervisor Chavez for her uh, co-sponsorship on this item. I uh, want to point colleagues to the uh, relatively recently arrived letters of support, both from the Health Trust and from Aki, as well as uh, Ms. Fong. And uh, I will move approval and uh, ask for a second. Thank you, Supervisor okay. Chavez. Second. Second. Thank you. Good. We don't have any members on this. No other comments. Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. And as Supervisor Smidian and I discussed shortly before our lunch recess, we now move on to item number 26. And 26 is to consider recommendations relating to the use of automated license plate readers in the city of Saratoga. We're we gonna hear from Supervisor Sumidian or from Captain Urena. Good uh, afternoon, Mr. Captain. Please, Supervisor Sumidian, what would you like on this? I would like to hear the presentation from Captain Urena and then see if we have any members of the public would like to speak on this item. Good enough. Uh, and then uh, we can take it from there. Thank you. Yep, Captain. Yeah, good afternoon, President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg, Supervisors. I hope you're all doing well this Tuesday afternoon. I don't have a presentation for you. I'm here to answer any questions that the board may have in regard to the agenda. Thank you. I appreciate your being here. Nancy, will you please allow our speakers in for up to two minutes each? Like our first speaker is Irvish Kumar Mehta. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Thank you very much, the Board of Supervisors. I wanted to mention about the agent item number 26 about the automated license plates, like license plate, as it is known that the California Motor Vehicle Department and as well as the California, uh, California Department of Motor Vehicles, both of them have already mandated the requirement for the automated license plate back in 2016, and as well as having the license plates be embossed such that you know they can be they can be reviewed and be identified by the law enforcement agency. It is also equally important to mention that, you know, some of the license plates, they are still, some of the vehicles, you know, which are still, you know, imposing the ban license plates because the reason that, you know, they, they have been utilizing the license plate, you know, which are, which are either personalized or customized. They are sometimes, you know, not being known to the law enforcement agency and, and also are these, also are easily replaceable through the fraudulent activities. Such li license plate, plate numbers are not recorded. It is, it is not a common practice you know, nowadays that you know, this, uh, such kind of items you know, are being captured very easily. But however, it is very important that you know, if it is being mandated within the city of Saratoga, it is, it is equally important to be mandated in every city within the county of Santa Clara. As well as it is important to, to it is also important to remember that that you know when we talk about the license plate, there are also renewals associated with that. Those are the stickers are also required to be identified when the when the license plates are being scanned by the law enforcement agencies. So, moreover, this mandate was already approved back then. I I think you know it is a more of understanding that you know it is required to be implemented in a way that the law enforcement agency programs can identify the fraudulent license plates. Thank you very much for your comments. 
Thank you. All right. And the captain is there available to us. We're done with public speakers. I'm turning back to Supervisor Simidian. And there's Sheriff Smith. Hello there. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, a couple things. Let me first uh, say thank you to uh, Captain Urena and the Sheriff's Department for uh, working so well with uh, the City of Saratoga and Privacy Office and the County Council. So uh, I think this comes to us uh, with the um, best uh, possible uh, language and presentation so that we've got issues resolved already. I would just ask uh, if Captain Urena could um, commit as they were kind enough to do uh, on the uh, Los Altos Hills case, uh, that when they come back with the annual uh, report, the impact report at the end of the year, uh, that we have a, a very clear and specific assessment of the, um, the impact and benefits of uh, using the technology. One of the sort of foundations of this work is that our board stops, has these conversations, uh, and we ask ourselves, all right, to the extent that there is some uh, potentially concerning impact on privacy and due process, is it in fact outweighed by the public benefit? Uh, I have indicated previously, I'm, I'm not really sold on the efficacy of uh, automated license plate readers. Uh, and uh, I know folks in these communities have made the judgment that uh, at their cost, they'd like to uh, acquire the technology and use it. I'm prepared to support that again today as I have in the past, but I do want to know uh, at the end of each year, so uh, to what benefit? So uh, Captain, is that something we can just get you on the record real quickly to say, sure, happy to provide that when you come back? Thank you, Supervisor Samidian, absolutely. We also recognize it there are some privacy concerns that folks may have, so we're prepared to come back to the board with a pretty thorough report on um, really what what uh, transpired in the entire year. Great, thank you for that. And Mr. Chairman, I'll just say, uh, you know, the report from the department says that uh, they've had a, a benefit or an impact in uh, a number of recent law enforcement investigations. It looks to me like that's been a couple um, I want to just ask that we not sort of overstate uh, the case. Uh, I take the point that a couple is better than not having the tool at all in the view of the folks who are using it. So, but uh, I just, I, I do think it'll be helpful to have that. All of that being said, um, I think yeah. we've got four things to do. Uh, item 26, A, B, C, D, yep. uh, receive the report, approve the use policy, adopt the findings and approve the uh, memorandum and I am prepared to uh, move approval and ask for a second. I'll second that. Thank you very much. In uh, Los Gatos now, they don't give out um, guest parking anymore. It goes on to your rear view mirror. The license plate reader just goes up and down the streets. And if you want to have a guest come over, you enter that guest license plate number into Los Gatos's computer system. And then the person giving out tickets knows that that car that they're driving by has a permit in the system. So they're being used in a myriad of different ways. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, that's that's interesting and not creepy at all. <laughs> um, so I, I, uh, I wanted to just do a follow-up question um, for the Sheriff's Department. And that is that, you know, as different jurisdictions are utilizing this tool, I mean, they're they're all part of, I know we have individual contracts with them. And so what I just want to make sure is that is the way this works is because we have an individual contract. This is an individual um, body of work that is attached between the sheriff's department and each city. Yep. Thank you for that question, Supervisor Chavez. That's correct. So we do have three contracts to provide police services. That's the town of Los Altos Hills, City of Cupertino and the City of Saratoga, and so this request is specific to the City of Saratoga. Thank you, Thank you. and and um, and the, that kind of brings me to my other question, and this is really about Cupertino and the unincorporated areas. Um, what would you know? And I realize that we would be responding to the City of Cupertino just based on the relationship that we're 
that we have with the other two locations. But I guess what I'm wondering is, as it relates to the unincorporated area and as it relates to just training and, and utilization of this tool, um, is this something that you would be evaluating to bring back to the board to look at for the unincorporated areas? And if so, would you be waiting a year or two to see how this works in the towns that are currently using the tool? Thank you for that question again. Um, we have had requests from our residents in the unincorporated areas in regards to this particular system. And so that is something we're gonna look at um, in the near future. In terms of the city of Cupertino, they, I don't wanna speak for the city, but they did show interest um, in this system as well. So that's something that I believe the council has on the work plan. I may be wrong. I know the Public Safety Commission did have it on the work plan. So this is something that we will continue to work on moving forward. Part of the colleagues, part of what prompted my question is that um, we have some areas up in the East Foothills where we've had particular challenges. Actually, Supervisor Lee, I, I, I don't now know whose district it is, so I apologize if I'm getting into yours, but because I, I have to look at the lines again. But uh, up in the East Foothills, you may recall where we've had folks with issues with um, not just speeding, but other kind of risky behaviors on the 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 really windy roads up, up in the east. Sierra Road. Yeah, thank you, Sierra's one, and also um, uh, the other one that just comes off of Alum Rock too, where we have a lot of bicycle cyclists. Oh, Hamilton. Yeah, thank you. And so I I am um, I was just curious about whether or not this is a tool we would consider in those areas and if so when you would be bringing them back and frankly if the, if the problems that we're seeing in those communities can be addressed by this i don't even know if that's if it's a right fit for the right tool it's just a question that i'm asking you all if, if you. where that falls in the consideration thanks mike thank you and i see a couple of other hands have gone up now um vice president ellenberg and then supervisor Smitty. Thank you. Um, yeah, Supervisor Chavez, I heard you say a little bit creepy. And um, I, I still have concerns about the technology. I think that um, we absolutely need to be increasing uh, safety on our roads. I strongly support the, the Vision Zero. Uh, I'm not convinced that the cameras are the best way to do it, given their um, the potential uh, misuse and disproportionate misuse. I, I tend to prefer uh, physical things that we can do, barriers, things to prevent um, the, the sideshows and the um, and drag races, speed bumps, all, all of those other pieces. Um, but I think that there, there, there really should be consideration of methodology other than the, the surveillance. So I'm going to abstain on, on the vote today. I understand that, that a lot of cities want it, it is their independent prerogative, but I'm not comfortable uh, voting in favor of it. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree, the city of Saratoga wants it, and uh, I happen to be a fan, but we have difference of opinions. Supervisor Smitty, and your hand is still raised? Yes, actually it's been re-raised, Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling on me. I, I just wanna uh, make a couple of comments and clarifications as somebody who's spent a fair amount of time on these policies. And it's really helpful, frankly, to have the board share their various thoughts and opinions and clear range of views. Um, uh, Captain Urena, my recollection is that the cost of the technology is actually borne by the cities that are requesting it, yes? That's correct, Supervisor. And I mentioned that, colleagues, because the, the, um, our ordinance comes into play because of the fact that we are in a contract with these communities and they have essentially asked uh, our sheriff's department as a contractor to uh, use the technology that the cities themselves are making the decision uh, to acquire at their own cost. And that, that may be relevant if this issue ever returns to us uh, with respect to uh, pretty much anywhere else other than Cupertino, meaning that incorporated areas, because then the cost benefit analysis has to include the fact that there is a cost to the tax paying public of our county that we would have to consider in a way that is somewhat different than the judgment exercised by a local city council on behalf of their taxpayers in the uh, Los Altos Hills or Saratoga or uh, potentially Cupertino. 
I also think it's important to point out that we've sort of quickly had probably half a dozen different use scenarios that we've just talked about. Well, what about here? What about there? How about using them this way? How about using them that way? Again, that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I pushed the ordinance back in the day was just to make sure we had those conversations. And I think what we would discover if we had them, uh, you know, in the future about other possible uses is that each one is a little bit different, if not outright unique. Um, so what might be appropriate in one venue is a little different in another venue. Um, Supervisor Wasserman, who was kind enough to second the motion, referenced to use in Los Gatos, which uh, if I understand it correctly, and that's accurate, Supervisor Chavez, I had kind of the same reaction you did. Uh, and uh, not to put words in anybody's mouth, but you know, all due respect, I don't think folks should have to tell uh, a government agency who's spending the night at their house, you know, to, to be quite blunt about it. So um, I, I think, uh, as I say, it's a case by case matter. Uh, I appreciate the conversation. Again, thanks to the Sheriff's Department. Um, the reason this one is easier, even though we're spending a little time on it, Supervisor Wasserman, is because Los Altos Hills was the first of our contract cities, uh, Captain Urena, to sort of say, we'd like to do that. We were able to work through a lot of these issues with them. So when it was time for the second city uh, to decide they wanted to step up and in, we had already uh, addressed many of those issues. And I, I do just want to reassure folks um, that the language of the uh, use policy very specifically limits in paragraph two what the authorized uses are. Uh, there are six bullet points. Uh, and then goes on to talk about the fact that all other uses not referenced shall be prohibited. Uh, also talks about the fact that live video, vehicle speeds, and audio shall not be provided or recorded. And perhaps most important to me is the fact that the data is purged no later than six months. Um, I have always had a concern about creating a, uh, a database of the movements of law-abiding citizens that lasted perpetuity. We are not, not, not countenancing that here. Um, in fact, it's a six month retention period at max. And uh, I think I will say thank you to you, Supervisor Wasserman for the second and ask for an I vote. I think we're pretty close to that. Nancy, fire away. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm abstaining. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to item number 27. We've and got Supervisor Wasserman, I think uh, if I may lean in on this, I think this one's a bit easier because uh, to everybody's credit, uh, folks in the privacy office and the county council's office and others uh, worked a while back, uh, colleagues, you all were required to have a uniform policy to cover all of these various cameras. Uh, so uh, we've been there, done that, and the possible actions are A and B to adopt the findings and approve the activation. I am prepared to move approval uh, and thank uh, everyone who was involved. Thank you. I'll second that as well. We have no public speakers. Any more discussion? Seeing none, Nancy, vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now go on to item 28. We should have our CEO of the SCVMC, and that would be PEL, giving the monthly report on the VHHP. Uh, Paula. Oh, it's uh, Selena. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, President Wasserman, members of the board, Celine Ho, Health Center Manager for the Valley Homeless Health Care Program. Yes. In your board packet, uh, we have responses to the board referral regarding 3C House on the Hill and our progress to streamline access to the substance use disorder treatment. Um, BHHP and the Behavioral Health Department work really closely together to develop a new workflow for direct referrals into the 3C House. Um, the team also met with 3C House and the management there to let them know the new process. And so we'll be starting to re, um, do those direct referrals and as well as monitor and track those referrals to make sure it's working as planned. Um, and then in regards to streamlining some of their substance use disorder treatment, um, the team, VHHP and behavioral health are also going to start meeting monthly um, to identify some short-term strategies 
to address some of the access barriers that, um, that were identified. And finally, you also have for your approval the sliding fee discount policy for the homeless population. Um, this is part of the HRSA um, requirements to review this policy annually and to ensure that um, we minimize the financial barriers for our homeless individuals. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Celine. Very clear, very concise. Members, we're being asked simply to approve the report and approve the sliding fee discount program. And I saw Vice President Ellenberg's hand up first, and then Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Lee. A lot of hands. Vice President. Just one second here again. Um, but thank you, uh, Celine, for the report. I, I want to express appreciation for behavioral health and the VHHP staff for your responsiveness uh, to address the issues of unhoused patients who are seeking substance use treatment at Parisi and other programs. This type of collaboration across the county organization to implement solutions is exactly what is needed in our county's resolution, needed in response to our county's resolution declaring a public health crisis for mental health and substance use disorder. Just as COVID was a whole of county response, rather than assigning responsibility to the public health department alone, I wanna make sure that we are expanding these opportunities to activate providers across our systems of care to work with behavioral health including VHHP, VMC, uh, uh, Office of Supportive Housing, uh, uh, SSA, and, and others. Uh, regarding the specific processes VHHP and behavioral health are putting in place to streamline referrals, I would be interested in having a future a VHHP report um, a report out on changes in utilization at Parisi and other such providers so that we can do a pre post evaluation of the of the changes. Does August make sense, uh, Celine? Is that enough time to see results and report back to the board? Yes, I think August is enough time for us to do that. Great. I look forward to to seeing how we, effective we're becoming. Thank you so much. Vice President Thank Ellenberg, you. was that a motion to approve with your added direction? In fact, it was. Thank you. It was. Supervisor Chavez, did you like what you heard? I did. I, I had um, just a, a couple of questions for Celine um, on this. Um, Celine, what are the other what are the other partners besides the Parisi House that you're looking at with behavioral health for homeless folks? Um, I think this one, uh, the Parisi House, and we've also um, looked at Mariposa, but I don't believe that um, that is under behavioral health um, contracted provider um, to house our homeless pregnant women. Um, we are also working with Office of Supportive Housing um, in order to prioritize some of our um, homeless pregnant women um, through some additional funding that the Office of Supportive Housing has. What about um, just for the homeless community in, in general in terms of access to services for drug and alcohol treatment? Yeah, I think that's something that we're working through with behavioral health to identify some of the um, the facilities that can be used um, to house some of the substance use um, treatment facilities. And so we'll be um, bringing back some of that information. And so we're starting to work with behavioral health on some of those um, in the coming months. You know, one of the, the requests that I would like to make on this is that I think um, just a couple of ideas. One is that I think this would actually be a very good conversation to have um, with reentry as well. And part of the reason is that these are the same folks that keep getting caught in our our web of of um, being in custody because we don't we don't really have placement. And I imagine that there's some set of people that we just need placement for. And the second thing, um, colleagues, I just to just to sunshine this that you know. Off and on, we've had conversations with the city of San Jose, even on our recovery center, about whether or not the recovery center is actually responsive, quite responsive enough to, to folks. And one challenge, for example, is at the reentry center in our recovery center, if you try to come over there, you, you need to be brought in by a police officer. So if you want to recover yourself, you have to get a police officer to bring you in instead of being able to walk in. And so I know we're trying to really remove barriers so people aren't waiting on computers and they're not waiting on phones. They can actually just walk in. But one thing that 
that I'll um, just sunshine for my colleagues is that I'm very interested in looking at targeted services for the, the population that we're seeing cycle in and out of custody for drug and alcohol needs. And very interested in looking at what we can do, what's the fastest way we can expand services um, to the homeless population. And in particular colleagues, one concern that I have is that we have a, a, a policy, as you all know, of um, housing first, which I think is the right model, absolutely. But the challenge is, is that when folks are moving into a new location with the housing first model, you have people that are in very different um, places in their sobriety and with their the services they're receiving. And so one of the opportunities that I'm hoping Celine, you and, and the Behavioral Health Department get a chance to dive into is how do we create clean, sober living environments for folks who are really interested in that as their, as their entree into other services? And what opportunities are we learning from the modular developments that can be applied to this area of, of work so that we might be able to build something out relatively quickly with a high, high enough number of beds, but still have a therapeutic environment? So I'm hoping that that will be on your discussion. I know that will be something I bring back to the board in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. And Supervisor, I need a second for Vice President. Oh, Mullen. second. Thank, Thank you. you very Sorry much. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, I'm very encouraged to hear about the development of the work group that will look into the same day placement options for patients seeking treatment for substance abuse. Those seeking help for addiction treatment needs to be captured at the right moment. And as relating to the work we're doing on the bed tracking, I would expect that this work group will work closely with the BHSD on, that, on identifying the available bed slots, uh, hopefully in real time soon. To reiterate a point I made during the FGOC meeting last week, I formally requested the administration to incorporate all the functions of the new backing tracking system, Merlin, used in LA County uh, into our VHSD's pilot bed tracking systems. And one of the function of Merlin system, of course, includes being a truly comprehensive bed registry solution. So I look forward to the day when our improvements in bed tracking will support our uh, county's effort to create same day placement option for individuals who are willing and ready to enter treatment immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. thank you. And um, Supervisor Lee, your hand is still raised. Did I cut you off? No, nope, I'm done, thank you. Thank you. We have no public speakers. We have a motion and a second. Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. We're now going to hear from Renee Santiago and Michelle De La Calle. Yes. An, update, an update on expansion of the Universal Screening Initiative. Yes, nice good afternoon, Renee. Mr. There's President. Michelle. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. President and Board of Supervisors. Uh, we have Michelle Del Calle, who's really been working directly with our partners to advance this initiative that's been a long-standing priority for you and the board in terms of expanding universal uh, behavioral health screenings here in our community. So Michelle is here to give you the latest update. Great, thank you, President Wasserman and the Board of Supervisors. I'm Michelle De La Calle, Director of the Office of System Integration and Transformation for the Health System. Um, based on the forward thinking of the board, your leadership and focus on the children and families in our community, um, we're grateful for the opportunity to present our report on the expansion of the Universal Screening Program. The work and referral allowed us to investigate and integrate further the services that we're providing um, and look at our current state and how we're going to further support the children and families of the Santa Clara County. As noted in the written report, we are on track with the timeline for expanding our work along the Healthy Steps model in partnership with First Five and UCSF. And we will be starting with one uh, Valley Health Center. We're gonna implement a tiered system of response for a standard visit protocol and increasing to warm handoff with embedded behavioral health uh, provider and navigation staff in the clinic site. This will support in real time the, family, the patient and family as needed, including the caregivers. Additional appointments would be scheduled and referrals made as indicated by the specific individual situation and needs. During this period of time, we will partner with the cohorts of clinics identified through first five and determine the right phased approach for all VSC clinics serving the pediatric populations 
and we will develop strong workflows for a warm handoff, navigation, and reimbursement. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Michelle. We don't have any members of the public wishing to speak. Uh, Vice President Ellenberg, your hand is raised. It is. Uh, thanks, Michelle. I, I really appreciate the effort uh, the VMC admin and clinical teams have put into this project. I'm certainly excited to see implementation start soon at Tully. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned briefly, the project has had significant support from First Five, Santa Clara uh, Family Health Plan, and Anthem to launch an initial cohort of seven to 10 clinics uh, with financial support of the training and technical assistance and evaluation that would be needed in, in fiscal 23. And while the county certainly has a role as a participant in this cohort at the Tali site, my original referral had also called on county staff in our health and hospital system to play a co-leadership role in the implementation of the cohort following the same model that was used back in 2013 with the Universal Developmental Screening Initiative that was launched uh, by my predecessor, Supervisor Ken Yeager. I know certainly that there have been significant staff changes both in the county and first five teams uh, since that time, but I'd like to direct again administration to take several actions to shore up the county's leadership role in this project. Uh, number one, for county staff, first five Santa Clara Family Health Plan and Anthem, to revisit the timing and makeup of the planned cohort and consider a schedule of phasing in sites in two or three rounds rather than all sites initiating on July 1st. Number two, if the county is only ready to implement uh, at Tully by July 1st, I'd like to ensure that resources are built into either out of are, are built in either out of the current year resources or uh, fiscal 2023 budget to support the service implementation costs, which is uh, primarily embedded behavioral health staff, so that community clinics are able to join the cohort. And third, I'd like us to get an off agenda report in May, please, on the approach to cohort timing, makeup, and funding agreed to with First Five and, and the partners I named before to be followed by a report to the board in October on progress at the Tully Clinic and recommendations for expansion. And that would be um, my motion. Michelle, if anything wasn't um, clear, you ha have questions about that, I would be delighted to answer them. I think on item two, Supervisor Ellenberg, if you could clarify um, the resources built in to support and the cost and where you, um, the full complement of that? Sure, either, either uh, and that I'll, I'll ask for you to come back with recommendations, but resources either from our current year or uh, to make sure that this goes into the fiscal 2022-2023 uh, budget to make sure that we are um, supporting the service implementation costs. For the VSC clinics? For the so the community clinics are able to community join the board. Yeah. Yep. Yes, uh, Supervisor Allenberg, we hear you clearly. Uh, what we'll do, since uh, our understanding, a lot of the initial costs is, is around training and education, and obviously getting our pediatrician certified by the state, and there's some reimbursement that flows mm -hmm. as a result of implementing some of these initiatives. So what we probably owe you is an analysis of how much is the reimbursement. Many of us, as you know, our FQHCs, cost-based reimbursement, and the population would qualify uh, for the full uh, reimbursement through Medi-Cal, but we need to get give you that analysis. And then there's any gaps, we'll, we'll definitely make it known. Thanks, Renee. And, and, and we know that we have, um, you know, financial buy-in and support that, that First Five has gathered. So let's make sure that we're also not leaving resources on the table that, we, that have already been made available to us. Thank right. you. Thank you so much. And um, I would ask for a second on my motion, please. I'll second it. And as, and I have some additions that I'd like to add. Supervisor okay. Ellenberg, are those, was that the extent of your questions and comments? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. We need to bring Google in here is what we need. Supervisor Chavez, you're next. Thank you. Um, you know, first of all, I, I 
again, I want to thank you for adding the history because you can see just the layered approaches that the board's taken because this has had an overall, there's been an overall interest in terms of how, how do we really get um, engaged with children at the earliest opportunity to provide the most support um, to them. And, I, and so I think this is a very, very exciting direction. Just to clarify for me, um, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding uh, this relative to the other center that's going to be opening up in June. Um, could, could one of you maybe talk to me a little bit about, about that? Yeah, but the way I would characterize this, this is more of an outpatient ambulatory primary care based model that we're trying to implement to capture as early as possible as many kids. Um, many of the cases that we anticipate that will be identified are borderline cases. So they may not manifest themselves with, during the primary care visit, but mm -hmm. we'll need a deeper assessment uh, before referring them to the specialty mental health system or the Specialized Children's Center of Excellence. So this would be the uh, uh, at, at the front end, if you could think of it that way, uh, that captures a lot more kids. As you know, kids come in regularly as part of the well child visits. So we want to add this evidence based clinical uh, early in, uh, identification and intervention as part of that process. And then, of course, be able to identify as early as possible as many of the kids that need help. So what I think might be of assistance is if we could do a little bit of a, a workflow um, on the report back. And, and the reason is, let me tell you the three programs that were all in my head at the same time. One is, you know, I know we, we're, we're um, not going to be using KidScope, that we're going to be using the Advocacy Center for the, the higher need once we identify a higher need child. Um, I recognize and uh, appreciate these, these are going to be at um, at clinics that they're well visit clinics, but but even before that, we are investing some resources in healthier kids to do these even pre screenings with a medical uh, professional, with a doctor and account uh, social worker. And so what I'm so I'm what I'm really wanting to understand is um, how does the expansion of the service mean that it will be easier for a family to get through the layers to to move to where the, the resource they need that that's kind of one issue that I want to make sure I understand. The second is that um, I, I do just want to emphasize something that has become more and more painfully clear to me and the reason I'm asking about healthier kids in particular is that the partnership and relationship we have with the schools is so critical to making sure that um, children get the services they need and frankly, um, the San Andreas Regional Center, just as one example, we have others where, where children can go to get services, but I think having the um, workflow and then the buy-in, almost MOUs, and I want to go back to the point that Supervisor Ellenberg raised about the partnership, the deep and meaningful partnership with First Five and our community clinics, but we have other players that we need to really buy in because essentially by, if we do this right, we're going to be sending more children to get more services at an earlier, you know, at a sooner um, level, both to the schools, the San Andreas Regional Center. And I forgot the third location that I'm thinking about that's actually on the VMC campus where high need children are getting served over off of, um, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but I know it's a partnership between the state of California and the county office bed. Um, so so I, I would really appreciate being able to see the workflow. Um, and then, does that, does that make sense? No, absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll represent it visually so that way um, you can figure out not only the different ages and stages of children from zero to five, but then also when they get reach uh, school age. Yeah, that's exact. I mean, that, that you just raised the right point. And, and, you know, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited that First Five is playing a leadership role because they're obviously, this is their area of expertise. Um, but I also think that, you know, the reason I'm kind of leaning in on healthier kids is I know they're they're even doing an, an even more, what I would call an even more um, initial screening. And so I just want to make sure I understand where all these screenings are in one place. And then again, if we can't understand the flow of how a family will use this and no one can. So that's really the, the goal. This is really great, great work. And I'm really excited about it. And 
uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, I'm really glad you're keeping your finger on the pulse of, of this body. So, <laughs> so I really, so this is really, really great work. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you very much, Renee. And I, and I appreciate the point you raised about, oh, I, you know, just maybe the, this won't be a question for today, but one thing when this comes back, I do think that understanding the changes that we anticipate happening at the state relative to the new insurance models, how they will or won't impact our ability to provide service. I don't think that the jury is, I mean, in my mind, the jury is still out on how those insurance products are, what they're gonna pay for, how much they're gonna pay for it, all of that, and who they'll pay. And so I recognize that some of the system will have to be malleable enough to address that sustainability. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Simonian. Uh, thank you. Let me uh, go back, uh, if I may, to Supervisor Ellenberg uh, through the chair. Uh, and Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, uh, thank you for your reference to um, the importance of including the community clinics uh, once we get past the Tully uh, experience. And I just wanted to uh, make sure I understood the inclusion uh, that is now part of a motion, which is essentially that uh, after we've uh, learned from our uh, hopefully good experience at Tully, uh, that uh, as we go forward and expand these efforts, we will be looking to community clinics, not just county clinics. Did I get that right through the chair? Yes. Okay. And um, Supervisor uh, Ellenberg and uh, Supervisor Chavez as maker and seconder, can I just ask that we include the phrase throughout the entire county uh, in that direction? I think I see uh, uh, an affirmation there. And my, my reason, of course, is I, 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 we've got um, <laughs> still in sig some significant parts of the county, including my district, uh, as reconstituted, um, no county clinics, uh, which means we rely on uh, our community-based clinics, uh, you know, as much if not more than in other parts of the county that are served by county clinics. And so, Mr. Santiago, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to you to because I know you know, for example, the work that Ravenswood Clinic does uh, in my district now, uh, having picked up. Uh, the Mayview operations in both uh, Mountain View and Palo Alto and Sunnyvale in Supervisor Lee's district. Uh, um, so it's going to be important that we look at uh, how we can make sure that these screenings get to uh, places that are not served by our own county infrastructure uh, and that we work with and through our uh, community clinics and again throughout the entire county. I appreciate the fact that my colleagues are willing to incorporate that quite specifically in the direction. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions to ask uh, staff. Is uh, based on a report that indicates that um, more than eighteen thousand children in the county have been have developmental delays that go unidentified until they entered uh, kindergarten, uh, which of course is very late. Uh, is that 18,000 number the current number or is it the number back in 2013 that's described when uh, Supervisor Yeager identified this problem? Thank you for the question, Supervisor mm -hmm. Lee. Um, yes, that is uh, back in 2013, the right. initial. Good, Earl. and would you say, what, what do you think would be our current number at this point? Uh, that's something that we would definitely have to uh, do some investigation and to see where the initial number was drawn and see if there's new um, data and information on that from the okay. community side. The expectation is that with UDASI, this should have uh, improved significantly, correct? Uh, that would be the uh, hope that it would have improved with the initial uh, round of screening started um, back in the 2013, based on the 2013 referral. Right, from nine years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the referrals coming from healthcare providers, uh, other than the PCP as stated, do we know who they are? Um, yeah, so when a referral comes in um, that is from a healthcare provider that we cannot clearly identify as a primary care physician, so it could be mm -hmm. um, somebody else in their um, 
clinic setting that is uh, submitting the referral, that would be identified as somebody other than the PCP because we cannot make the direct link to the PCP. Okay. Um, and then the report in the, the Margolis et al. study uh, mentions that the majority of the infant to five-year-old services targeted caregiver or family well-being as a mechanism for supporting healthy child development and mental health. Do we have a system in place to measure or treat the caregiver mental health, uh, say, other than the proposed ACS screening? The current um, screening processes that are in place in the clinic settings mm -hmm. do include some caregiver screening um, in line with the uh, screening for developmental. So okay. there, is, there are currently some screenings in place. Um, the current uh, process will hopefully enhance that uh, a bit on the first uh, appointments, and that warm handoff will also enhance that to the behavior embedded staff. Okay, all right. Good, okay, and that's the questions I have, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, so we have the original motion by Vice President Ellenberg, second by Chavez. And no more speakers. Oops, we've got hands gone back up. Vice President Ellenberg. I just want to clarify here because we've kind of um, morphed into the, the school age population. The, the, the focused effort here is intended to really be on the zero to five population. And in response to Supervisor Smitty and, and, um, and the conversation around the community clinics, absolutely, they should be a part. And the, the vision really should be that the seven to 10 clinics in the cohort should be a mix of community-based, um, possibly even um, private in-network with, with Santa Clara uh, Family Health Plan. I just want to keep us uh, focused a, a little bit because there are so many good and broad ideas that, that are brought up. Thank you. I think that's been heard. No other hands, so I'm gonna jump in here. Nancy, take a vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you very much. We're now gonna go on to item 30. We should have Danielle Christian and Steve Preminger here, and it's regarding the state trailer bill language. And I see Dr. Smith, who might be leading this off. Yes, I'm going to take this one on. All righty. This is recommended recommendation that the board take an opposition uh, position regarding an exclusive uh, contract that's being recommended for Medi-Cal with Kaiser um, Health System. And I'd like to take you through a little bit uh, the discussion about how we think this will negatively affect uh, patients. Um, and I'm going to share the screen here if I can. Hopefully, you can see that. Um, yes. The board knows that um, Medi Cal is embarking upon a complete um, remodeling. Um, up until now, Medi-Cal in, in California has been um, covered through HMOs and some counties have two plan system like ours where um, Family Health Plan and Anthem Blue Cross serve as the only health plans that can contract with the state for the care of Medi-Cal patients. Others have one uh, HMO, some have a regional HMO. But the remodel that's being envisioned for Medi-Cal is CalAIM. And this is a picture that describes what envisioned is envisioned with CalAIM. And really there are at least six components um, at this point, which is expanding Medi-Cal benefits beyond the physical health care benefits that have previously been uh, the focus. We're expanding into behavioral health care, oral health care, social drivers of health, includes enrollment in social services, 
And as you can see down there at the bottom, care for the foster youth and for special populations, also developmental and intellectual disability services and long-term care. So the concept behind CalAIM is to really be an expansive, comprehensive wraparound service line with many benefits offered to the Medi-Cal population. Um, obviously the population gets the services that they need. We're concerned about the exclusive contract with Kaiser because as most of you probably know, Kaiser does not have the capacity to provide many of these services. They have minimal behavioral health care, minimal oral health care, essentially no uh, services for social services like the county, um, minimal developmental care, and minimal long-term care. And on top of that, um, they are a closed network, meaning that patients who belong to Kaiser only go to Kaiser uh, facilities unless they get special authorization. Unlike the county, um, they do not have contracts with the community health providers. Um, they do not provide have service provided in the community of need. As you know, many of our Medi-Cal patients have particularly um, community-related problems, substance abuse, mental illness, complex medical problems. Uh, Kaiser does not have that capacity at this point in their system. So it's anticipated that in order to comply with a contract that's being envisioned, Kaiser would have to focus on, quote, the healthy Medi-Cal patients, leaving others in the lurch. Um, so we recommend a position in opposition or at the very least oppose until modified so that there can be some guarantee that patients who are accepted onto Kaiser for Medi-Cal would get the full range of care. Right now in our county, Family Health Plan does contract for some of their lives with Kaiser, but many of the services that are needed are contracted out to other providers. So that's the reason why we're concerned. With that, I'll be open for questions. Thank you. Supervisors, any questions of Dr. Smith? Vice President Ellenberg. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Um, I wanted to just ask a couple, if you could help us really understand the numbers a little bit and the magnitude of this of this challenge. All right, can you offer an estimate on the number of VHP enrollees that might shift to Kaiser under this plan? And then what the estimated dollar value of the impact on capitation revenues might be to uh, VHP and VMC? Well, um, as you know, the two plans in this county are Family Health Plan and Anthem. And between them, they have in the region of about 400,000 lives. Um, Family Health Plan then delegates about half of those to um, us through Valley Health Plan so that we can provide comprehensive services. Um, it's hard to predict how many would um, transfer. I think in reality, most patients are wise enough to know that Kaiser doesn't have the full panoply of services that they need. So I would not expect a huge transfer of patients, uh, but I would expect that the healthier patients would transfer to Kaiser. Um, so that would be probably mostly kids, mostly young adults, mostly women who um, have pregnancies. Uh, so the services that the county would be providing would be uh, the most complex service and the most complicated ones. And I can't give you a number uh, for costs because at this point it's sort of up in the air. We don't really know what the cost structure will be for the proposed contract with Kaiser. Um, 
And so it'd be hard to say exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. That makes sense. Um, but tomorrow, the the CSAC uh, executive committee is going to be considering a position on this um, matter. And I want to um, make sure all of my colleagues know that the CSAC staff recommendation uh, will be to oppose as well. And we're expecting that the trailer bill language will be pulled into a, a policy bill. That's AB 2724 this week. And since um, and Danielle, please um, correct me if I'm if I'm getting anything wrong. Uh, but since it may now move through the policy process rather than exclusively the budget process, now is really a critical time uh, to register opposition to protect local control. Um, you know, and really um, express our concerns about the resulting patient mix as as outlined in the ledge file. So thanks. Um, Thanks, Dr. Smith and uh, Danielle, and I think it really is important that we that we voice our opposition uh, and at the same time find ways to work with administration, uh, with the state administration on a better plan. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I, um, I just wanted to ask a follow up question of Supervisor Ellenberg, and that is um, if it if they go through a policy. If, taking it down the policy route how does that impact the, the process it's faster is what you're saying but also then how do they get the contract if it goes through that route i think i might need danielle's help i know that the policy piece means that there is much more opportunity for engagement and tweaking of language rather than a straight up or down on the dollars uh, but but hoping um someone with a little bit more state ledge experience Oh, <laughs> through the chair. Yes. The guy in the blue shirt might be able to help us <laughs> with process here. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Allenberg and Supervisor Chavez. And certainly want to hear from uh, county staff uh, who will be current and up to date on this in a, in a way that I think is helpful. But I was really pleased to hear from Supervisor Ellenberg that there is a move afoot to move this conversation into um, the policy arena rather than the budget arena. Uh, about a decade ago, in the last few years when I was in the state legislature, uh, there developed an unfortunate practice in my view, which was uh, that rather than provide the sort of full uh, and transparent consideration of what were really legislative matters, uh, folks would try to hustle them through the budget process in a way that precluded that kind of conversation. And um, I, I, I don't think it's good government, I, and I don't say that abstractly. I think it actually produces a product that um, does not serve the public well. And so, you know, if there's a case to be made for this approach, then it, it shouldn't be hustled through the budget process. It should be done through a much more deliberative process. Uh, and, you know, presumably, uh, if it were a matter of great urgency, it could be done as an urgency bill, which would require two thirds. Mm -hmm. uh, if it uh, did not require that level of urgency, then obviously a legislative vehicle, a bill, uh, that is introduced this year uh, could be passed and signed into law uh, this year. Um, so I think, you know, there's ample opportunity here to both do it right and consider the matter in what I would consider an expeditious way. Uh, and I'm sure that, uh, so I'll just stop there on that piece, turn back to uh, Supervisor uh, Ellenberg and Chavez uh, to finish their remarks. I do uh, imagine that we've got folks from Kaiser who are here today who are going to want to speak, and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say about this before we take a vote. Thank you. Yes, we do. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, my follow-up question um, to that is really uh, to you, Dr. Smith. Um, one challenge I do see is a challenge of capacity. And, you know, during, during COVID, frankly, we didn't have all of the help we needed from our nonprofit and private sector partners. I think, you know, I, I and so one concern I have is that the, I'm, I guess I'm not really understanding the strategy from the governor's office 
um, or whoever is putting this forward about why they would make the recommendation they're making. Dr. Smith, I probably can't give you any insight into the governor's office, um, but I would say that um, certainly Kaiser is well respected as a long-term HMO in the state and they do have good quality numbers. Um, but I would just point out that they have a different patient population. Um, essentially all, not all, but the vast majority of their members are employed and, you know, not as financially challenged as our patients, our Medi-Cal patients and our uninsured patients. So um, if I could make any guess what the governor was thinking when he did a, a non-bid contract, I would suspect he was thinking that uh, the quality numbers would help with his uh, sponsorship of CalAIM. However, not to, you know, criticize Kaiser in any way. Um, they have a built-in advantage for their quality numbers because of their patient population. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Do we, we go to speakers now, Supervisor Chavez, or do you have more questions? No, that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Samidi, and your hand is still raised? No, not anymore. Okay, and our speakers have disappeared. Nancy, I was looking for, oh, now Eric has appeared. All right, we've got uh, Kaiser Vice President Eric Williams. Mr. Williams, you'll have up to five minutes to speak. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon, President Wasserman and other distinguished Board of Supervisors of Santa Clara. My name is Eric Williams. I'm the Senior Vice President and Area Manager for Santa Clara. And we greatly appreciate the opportunity to provide you our perspective on the state's uh, proposed improvements to Medi-Cal. The federal government, governor, and legislature have all committed to transform Medi-Cal to a program based on whole person care. This includes the CalAIM initiative. The four overarching goals of this transformation are to improve quality, reduce disparities, preserve member continuity, and remove layers of complexity and cost. In the state's efforts to do this, Kaiser Permanente was approached to expand Medicaid membership. We're committed to this population and we're willing to expand, but at the same time, we do not want to destabilize the safety net in the process. So we're trying to achieve a very delicate balance. In this contract, we have agreed to take on complex patients who are dual eligible members, such as seniors with Medi-Cal and Medicare and foster youth. Our goal is to be very intentional with this growth, so not to have a negative impact on the local safety net. We realize this is a very significant and complex issue, and it's also part of a much, much broader environment we're all working in, where both the federal and state governments are asking us all to adjust to do more. I'm joined here today with our subject matter expert, Ms. Casey Verlerde, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, President Wasserman. Thank you. Casey. Hi, thank you. Yes, I'm here for questions if you have any. Thank you very much. And Nancy, do we have one more speaker or not? I do see one member of the public with their hand raised. Yep, please allow them two minutes. Richard Gallo, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Richard, I see you have unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Richard, if you can hear me speak. You are unmuted, but we are not hearing you. All right, do we still have one more speaker? That is the only speaker. Okay, so he's the one I still see, and that person's gone in the queue. Good can enough. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hello, supervisors. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Gallo, G-A-L-L-O. -L -L -O. I am opposing to the contract that the governor has requested or contract with Kaiser. My two main concerns in serving the Medi-Cal population is number one, the behavioral health care. They are not doing a good job meeting the needs of patients who are seeking psychiatric counseling services. They have been cited by the state. It's an issue, it's a problem that you need to be aware of. Secondly, durable medical equipment. 
is Kaiser going to do what they need to do in serving the disability community and meeting their personal needs to maintain their independence with durable medical equipment. I had this problem 20 years ago with Kaiser with hearing aids that I wasn't obtained. They offer a monthly plan of only three months for me to pay $5,000 of hearing aids that I did not have, that was not feasible, that was inconsiderate of Kaiser being small-minded and serving individuals like me. How do you expect me to pay $5,000 within three months when I work in the nonprofit sector? So take all this into consideration and you're reviewing and putting language into it so that they make sure they serve the medical population. Remember, you have a lot of individuals who are disabled on this particular program. Thank you, supervisors. Thank you, Nancy. I don't see any other speakers. That's correct. All right, we're gonna go back to the supervisors now for additional comments and or emotion. Mr. Williams, thank you for being here. Um, I do have a question for you, Mr. Williams, if I may. Um, over the years, I've heard of various citizens having a hard time accessing mental health services. They're Kaiser members and having a hard time accessing mental health services. Could you, in 60 seconds, tell me what's happening there? Uh, thank you, President Wasserman, for the question. And I, I heard the, the message from the, um, the member of the community, so we'll follow up on that. You know, mental health services uh, is we're looking to expand uh, generally our, our staffing levels in that area. That's something that our regional team has identified as a challenge that we need to, um, to explore, to mitigate. So there's a couple of elements in the next strategy plan that's working to address that. And we have added some elements into different components of the care. So I will, I'll work back and make sure I get a, a specific follow-up to you into your office. Super, thank you very much. All right, members, any, we have before us a requested action of approving an opposed position to the state trailer bill. And we got an update from our legislative liaison, Vice President Ellenberg. Move approval of the staff recommendation. Motion by Vice President Ellenberg for approval. Do we have a second? A second by Supervisor Chavez. Any further discussion? All right, and Vice President Ellenberg, thank you very much for the update on what the uh, county organizations is, is doing. I appreciate that. Nancy, a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And going forward, I certainly hope all of our medical facility partners continue to expand the services that they provide so that all of Santa Clara County can be serviced in the way that they need to be. I think COVID coming along a couple of years ago um, unveiled some holes in our countywide system that uh, each of us independently and I hope jointly are addressing. With that, we're gonna move on to item number 31, which has to do with the micro business grant program. And I'm guessing, I'm gonna guess Glenn Williams. That was an excellent guess, President Wasserman. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to address the board. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, wanted to uh, share. A, this is really in response to three referrals that the board has made over the last month. And if you'd like, I will bring up, uh, I share my screen. Yes. And Glenn, when did the legislative file for this go out? The original legislative file went out several days ago. Okay. Uh, there was a follow-up that I presented uh, that was literally added uh, first thing this morning. Okay. Because we are fortunate enough to have... Can you see my screen? No, we no. cannot. Uh, I'm... <laughs> 
Nancy, is there a way you can help, Glenn? Sure can. I'm on it. Fantastic. On it. That would be uh -huh. fabulous. Look at that. Way All to right. go, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, in answer to your question, the uh, there was an update that was submitted first thing this morning uh, with yeah. this slide presentation. So there's, new, there's actually new information in this slide presentation that you did not see in the original uh, report. That is correct. Uh, and, all right. and it's all good news. So <laughs> let me go ahead. Uh, are you, can you take me? And Glenn, any Glenn, any summarizing you can do. I will rather, do that. Rather than reading, we'd appreciate it. I will absolutely do that. Uh, the board requested three reports. The first one was on the status of the program. The second one was to uh, analyze whether or not it was possible for the county to provide advance funding because of the delays by the state. And the third one was to uh, ask whether or not uh, it was possible to apply the program or some variation of it to businesses that were uh, begun after, uh, you know, 2019. Next sheet. Uh, just to, for the purpose of the public, the program was created by Cal Osma to assist qualified California micro businesses that were impacted by COVID-19. The county agreed to accept about two to $2.4 million of state funds so we could award 875 grants of $2,500 each to our very small businesses. And we uh, it began accepting applications at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. on Thursday last. Next page. Uh, we're doing this in two phases. The first one is to on a first come first serve basis, which began on Thursday, with an allocation of 500 grants available. Phase two will be for the balance of the grants that are available, and those will not be first come first serve. Uh, those will be done on a program very similar to what we did for the. Uh, small grants that we did from fees and uh, pen penalties that were assessed to non-compliant businesses. Uh, and the purpose of having two phases is so that we both get an early opportunity to help people who really need it, but at the same time, make sure that the overall program is balanced to reach all of the subgroups that the state was trying to target, including veterans, women-owned businesses, et cetera. Current status on the program is as of yesterday afternoon, we have received 830 applications. Oh. Uh, they were, we offered the program in three languages. 591 were in English, 179 were completed in Spanish, and 60 were completed in Vietnamese. Now that's not necessarily an ethnic breakdown, that is merely a language breakdown. So that many of those that responded in English may in fact qualify in uh, the same categories of being uh, Spanish, you know, uh, Spanish heritage or Vietnamese heritage, for example. Okay, next page. Uh, yes, as, as of yesterday, the administration executed an amendment to the grant agreement so that if in fact the board wishes to provide advanced funding, the state is perfectly willing to let us do that and make sure that we uh, are reimbursed for that. Next page. The in answer to the expanded eligibility question, the state has been very clear that this program was not going to be modified to allow for businesses that were not in business in 2019. However, the state has announced a new program called the Dream Fund, which uh, they are currently rolling out, and it offers classes followed by the opportunity to qualify for a five to ten thousand dollar grant from the state and it's specifically directed to small businesses that began operations after July 1st of 2019. And at that point, I'll, I'll open it up if you have questions. And also, I believe uh, Dennis King is present also, uh, who's the director of the Enterprise Foundation. So if you have specific questions of him. The great Dennis King, nice to see you, sir. Thank you, Supervisor. All right, I see a couple of hands raised. Supervisor Chavez first and Supervisor Smitty. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to move receipt of the report along with asking the staff to advance the funds since we know we're going to be reimbursed. And then I just have a question. Second. 
Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. Supervisor Chavez, your addition, your question. Thank you. Um, perhaps I can ask this question of Dennis. Dennis, does the second program, um, do you think that the Dream Fund will address the folks that that really got kind of left out of the of the other programs? That's my hope. We're our very first training program or training on that program is actually tomorrow. So I'll be able to answer much more definitively. But that's my hope. Yes. Um, because in that instance, we, we would not need to start a new program, but rather make sure that we're directing people to this current program. The, the, I mean, I'm sorry, the dream program. That is my hope. Okay. And Dennis, if that's not the case, will you let us know? Yes, I will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, thanks for the report. Want to want to clarify and confirm that um, you have asked the state, can we move these funds along out of our own county resources and then get reimbursed, assuming that they are appropriate uh, allocations? And the short answer to that is yes. The short answer to that is absolutely yes. And that um, took a little uh, flexibility and uh, conversation, I assume, yes? Yes, and the state was most responsive. That It went through county council. County council negotiated the terms of the amendment to the agreement. Well, thank you to all. My recollection on this one through the chair is, Supervisor Chavez, that this was an issue you pushed. If I, am I remembering that correctly? Yes. Yeah, well, then I want to say good on you uh, because um, we all know there are people out there hanging on by a thread. And it's really hard to get big entities like the state and even our county with our 20,000 employee organization to be nimble in times of crisis. I think that's, you know, sort of a, uh, an obvious observation based on what we all just uh, have experienced in the pandemic. But I think, you know, the exhortation from Supervisor Chavez and the work then that county staff did with county council's help to make that possibility real is, is really important. We'll never know who hung on and couldn't have lasted another day, a week or a month longer without that kind of flexibility. But again, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased, candidly, I'm pleasantly surprised, but I'm really pleased that Supervisor Chavez raised in the first place and that staff and county council were able to make it real and, you know, uh, even got to give a tip of the hat to the state for um, showing a little flexibility, which is always our experience. So thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, yeah, great report on the implementation. I just want to say thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, as, the, uh, as the announcement going up March 14th, uh, now that it uh, accepting uh, applications in March 17th, which is just last week, we have already received 830 applications. So that certainly uh, shows that the outreach was uh, very, very successful. So congratulations on that good work. Now, um, the first phase of the application is supposed to be limited to 500 on the first come first serve basis. Since we have received 830 applications, is this safe to say that basically that first phase is already over? In answer, there are two parts to the question. One is that there, that certainly indicates that the first 500 grants will already be spoken for. We are not terminating that though. We're continuing to allow uh, individuals to continue to apply. And then those will be automatically rolled over into the second phase. Right. And, super, and Supervisor Lee, if I may, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Williams, I saw the numbers that Supervisor Lee just said as well. But just because you've received an application, are those approved applications? Uh, no, they're not approved, but they're a very, very, very large. Um, I would say almost all of them probably will be qualified. Wonderful. Because, Thank you. Because the, ap the application process is such that it self-selects. If, if you Go don't have the qualifications, you're out. Thank you for that. I understand. Thank you very much. I didn't know that. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And then the other question I have is, so how soon can the funds be released based on the, the current timing for this first phase? I don't have a specific answer for you. If in, uh, up to the, uh, as far as how 
quickly it would be possible to process probably by next week. Uh, the question is whether or not the funding mechanism from the county can implement that in time that they can in fact then uh, draw so, down against it. And, and actually supervisor through the chair, yes. um, supervisor to supervisor Lee, and I guess this would be to staff, this was gonna come back to us on April 5th for final action. So I imagine that the money wouldn't be available before then unless we delegated authority to the staff by allowing like not having them have to wait till april 5th but took the action today to allow staff as the as they dotted the t's and crossed the i's to to move forward as swiftly as possible right uh, supervisor we do have to come back on the fifth because the board has to authorize the appropriation modification in order to do that um and so we'll move as rapidly as we can. Great. And then the uh, report mentioned that the uh, phase one is open for 45 days, right? So it's 45 days starting from last Thursday. And phase two will take place after phase one concludes. Um, my other question is, if phase one concludes so much sooner, since we are moving so quickly, I wonder if it makes sense to start the phase two uh, basically immediately and not wait till the 45 days. Yeah, there's no way. Uh, reason why it would have to be waiting for, the, for that long. Uh, we did that with not knowing how many uh, applications we would get in first phase, mm -hmm. whether there would be less than 500 applications or more. Sure. Uh, what we want to do is to wait long enough that we can do an analysis of the first 500 right. so that we can adequately structure the second phase. Great. And uh, do you have any idea how we're going to measure the, uh, effect in the, the effectiveness of this grant program later on? Is any metrics that's being developed? No metrics for the effect of it. There are certainly metrics and reporting requirements to the state, mm -hmm. uh, basically every two months in terms of who's getting the grants and what the uh, you know various demographics are for uh, the grants that are awarded. But there's no follow-up that says, you know, did people actually uh, save their lives by doing this? We, we don't have a follow-up metric. Yeah, so we don't be able to measure is uh, how many applicants receive, what's the percentage of them being approved, maybe a metrics as to the number of days it takes for the money to get to them, things like that, right? Yes, we can provide all of that. Okay, good. That's our question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Submitting, did you have an additional question or comment? Nope, did not. So we have the motion, we have the second. I'm gonna ask Nancy to call for a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. I just wanna say, Glenn, great job, and Dennis, great seeing you and great job. Thank you. Take care, gentlemen. Thank you. We now move on to 34 and 35 which during the consent item, it was agreed upon would be heard together. 34, let me just switch over here. The termination of the sister city county relationship with Moscow and 35, uh, part two of that. And Dr. Smith, are you speaking first? Yes, I'm gonna try to take this one. All righty. Uh, these two items come out of the realization that uh, the war that is currently going on in the Ukraine uh, was actually started with no reason by uh, Russia and an appropriate response is necessary. The uh, county established a county city sister relationship back in 1994 and created the Sister City Commission. Um, we're not recommending that we change that at all. Um, the relationship with the commission has been a positive relationship. The commission has relationships with you know, residents of Moscow, um, not with the government of Moscow. However, in 2004, the Board of Supervisors embarked upon an effort to uh, build a relationship between the governments 
of the county and the government of Moscow, the city. That effort um, has floundered and in reality, not much has happened with it. We're suggesting that the board take action to um, forego that relationship with the government of Moscow, continue the commission, but make it clear that in response to the war, um, we're not supportive of an ongoing relationship with the government of the city of Moscow. You have before you ordinances to consider um, and uh, a county council can ask questions about those. Thank you, I like that direction. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank the county executive and staff for the work on this uh, resolution drafted so quickly to stand with the people of Ukraine. Uh, we are now on day 27 of this uh, invasion that we've all watched in horror uh, as a brutal invasion and war by the Russian Federation government against uh, Ukraine. And certainly many of us feel so helpless to stop this war. But I do believe that our action uh, today or what we're going to take eventually will be able to uh, work as a voice to help spark the light for these dark matters. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as a combat zone veteran myself, I've been in the middle of these uh, type of uh, situations and being, you know, 90 feet away from mortar attack. Uh, and, and I've lost friends who, who, who did not survive these type of attacks. And so I really do understand the, the pain that's suffering that's going on in Ukraine. And really, we need to do whatever we can uh, to bring peace, to, to pressure, to bring peace, to and then certainly uh, uh, stand in support of, of, of Ukraine. Um, and while we cannot vote <laughs> to bring peace directly, we certainly can show some solidarity and support today. Uh, and I do believe that we must add our voices to help end this uh, atrocity. Um, and I believe that we should be engaged in partnership with, uh, with uh, the people. I think it's so important for us to distinguish the differences. The people in Moscow that we have relationship with through the commission, uh, as opposed to the government of Moscow and the, and the, and the, and the Russian Federation government. Um, and so to me, it seems to me that I, I agree that we are not today uh, wanting to terminate the commission's work at all. I think commission's work has been great, it's been going on for many years. Uh, and because we certainly do not want to cut off our very important line of communications to the very people that could help us influence and potentially stop this war. I am the board's liaison to the Sister County Commission and my office has been in close communication for many members of the Moscow Sister County Commission who feel very strongly that the commission remains intact to continue the citizen diplomacy work uh, who have urged us to think carefully through any of these proposed changes we're making today. So what I would like to do, uh, basically, is like to request administration to return to the board with a revised resolution uh, at the next meeting on April 5th. Uh, and I have a few suggested edits to ordinance and bylaws that I would like the board to consider. The suggested edits actually have been incorporating the feedback from many members of the Moscow Sister County Commission. Uh, for example, like suggesting softening the language, removing the word necessary terminate, and I would like to also staff to consider language changes to the ordinance or bylaws that don't negatively impact the commission's ability to receive grant funding for diplomatic efforts through the open world or the sources or not be included in the Sister, Sister, Sister Cities International. Uh, and also I would like to recommend adding language to condemn the actions by the Russian Federation government and have any county of Santa Clara align in solidarity with Ukraine and Ukrainian people. And so for these reasons, I'm actually going to ask to have this item come back at the April 5th meeting to allow staff time to work with our office on these suggested edits on the documents that we work the language that can ultimately be supported uh, by many of our commissioners serving on the Moscow City County Commissions. Uh, and uh, I certainly would like to continue to ask them, to con the, the commission to continue the, their efforts uh, and for the commission to adopt similar resolution as the board to condemn the actions by the federal, uh, the Russian federal government. And I would also like to ask uh, whichever resolution is adopted 
to have that translated into Russian and Ukrainian so that we may share our solidarity with the Ukrainian families in Santa Clara County and across the world. Thank you. So Supervisor Lee, you're, you're asking that both 34 and 35 come back to our next board meeting? Correct, yes, to come back. So no, uh, vote, no vote to be taken on either one at this time. Correct. The direction, you've given some direction and you've offered to work with staff Yes. to help bring back revised ones at the next meeting. That's correct. Okay, I'll be happy to second that motion. Vice President Allenberg. Uh, if I could, I'm, I'm interested to know, and, and I'll look to County Council, um, how this fundamentally, if it does change the action, I, I certainly wanna be respectful and deferential uh, to my colleague and Supervisor Lee, as always, thank you. Uh, for your service, um, I was looking forward to uh, to uh, voting to approve these items today and to making a statement. But before I do that, let me just ask um, what impact the requested changes will have. Supervisor Lee. Yes, uh, I don't believe it would change. Uh, ultimate I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was asking uh, for County Council. Okay. James, Mr. Williams. Sure, as, as I understand it, and and um, it, as I understand the request from Supervisor Lee, they would be to not terminate the sister city relationship um, and to make other similar edits, but to continue with the resolution that's condemning the actions taken and to focus the commission's work on non-governmental related activity. But I think the the essence of the current administration action, which terminates the formal relationship with um, the sister city international organization, um, that would change as I understand it, but I'd look to Supervisor Lee if, for any clarification on that, but that's how I understand it. Right. Yeah. Changes. Supervisor sure. Lee. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, maybe then I'll try to clarify. So it's, I would see it as basically Maybe you could look at it as three separate different relationships. One is the what we call the government to government relationship between Santa Clara County government and the uh, Moscow government. And so far from our record, we really don't have much of a relationship there. And we certainly don't want to start anything. And that definitely has to be, uh, is, is clearly not non existent and needs to be ended. Uh, as far as the Sister City International, that's an organization that arranges these um, exchanges. And their existence, I mean, the cost of it is fairly nominal per year to cost about $2,200 a year to belong to it. But what it does is it does facilitate the uh, the members uh, in, in both commissions on both sides to have the ability to communicate, to foster the exchanges. And we have various delegations came through through this organization. And then this organization also helps provide, for example, when you could travel, you might need a visa so that some of the members, let's say in the, the, the Russian commission, who might want to work with us, whether it's the public defender's office in, in, in Moscow or somebody who's working uh, on the educational side, uh, without that relationship, you no, know, that doesn't existence, it might actually make it very difficult for them in the future, for example, trying to come to the United States to get these and things like that. So that that's, Sister City International does provide some benefits uh, to continue that type of uh, work. work. Uh, but most important to me, I think, is the people-to-people -people relationship that we have with our commissioners here and the people in, in over there in Russia, which are not governmental representatives, but they are just individuals who would, would like to continue developing this type of relationship of exchanges with Santa Clara County. And I want to make sure the people-to-people -people is so important because at the end of the day, uh, it is the people that 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 we are working together. Uh, and I would like to just quote a, a phrase being used by a very brave, uh, brave uh, 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 journalist in Russia. If you have heard the names Marina Alvis Yadnikova, who actually burst onto the TV set, Russians Channel One uh, past week, holding up this no war sign. Um, and of course, she was immediately, you know, put down, was questioned, and uh, uh, and and in her 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 work that he, she did, she made a video that basically says the following: 
She called on the Russian people to protest the war, saying only they have the power to, quote, stop all this madness, unquote. And what this is so important is that we believe that it truly is the Russian people who's living there, who living in Moscow, that absolutely have the greatest influence to potentially help end this, this war. And I think that our contact with the, the individuals who's, who's living in Moscow right now through our relationship potentially could be influential to make that happen. So I think it's important for us to use that influence and relationship uh, and maintain that certainly. Supervisor Lee, um, I, I absolutely agree on maintaining the people-to-people relationships. Is it the case that the that middle level that you're talking about, that international, is run by the Russian government, though? Oh, no, it's not the government. It's actually a uh, international organization. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, not, it's not part of the Russian government at all. No, that, that's, uh, that's what I, I, I've learned, at least from my, my research. And, and the Sister City International is an international organization. They do... Um, uh, foster is not just a Russia, it, it's just actually throughout, for throughout the world. So, for example, we have two other uh, sister county that we work with, for example, in Sinsu County in Taiwan, and also uh, the Florence County in Italy. And those are all also work through the sister uh, county and sister cities international. And that's what they do is try to get us connected. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate all of that. I hear it. Um, and I, I realize that there's not a tremendous actual difference between approving today and a couple of weeks from now. Our action has a fairly limited effect, if any, on what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, but I, I still feel that there, there's really an urgency for our county to, to speak out um, at our soonest available opportunity, which may be today, against the really irresponsible, horrendous human suffering that is happening in Ukraine and women and children and families are targets. Uh, Indiscriminate bombing with illegal cluster bombs is destroying food stores and apartment complexes. Bomb shelters where children are being held in safety have been targeted. There have been attacks on hospitals and maternity wards, all all as... um, as uh, Dr. Smith said at the beginning, for an unprovoked and unnecessary war. Um, I, I do agree that, that the statements should be clear that we can't, um, that, that we cannot continue this, these relationships uh, right now. I think that we have to stand with the resilient and brave people of Ukraine and the, the statement to them may be most powerful if it's if it's entire, so I'm I'm interested if any of my other colleagues want to weigh in to hear their thoughts. But thank you again, Mr. Smithian. Thank you. I um, want to make sure we hear from the public, uh, Supervisor Wasserman. But um, in fairness to the public, I also want to put my thoughts out there, uh, and uh, I'm going to offer a substitute motion in a moment. Hope I get a second. Um, and here's my, my reaction. First, I want to say to staff, um, I thought that county administration and county council's office had a very difficult challenge, which was to thread the needle quite carefully so that we made the statement that we hoped to make while still preserving the opportunity for people to people exchange Uh, which we believe is beneficial. And I think you did that quite adeptly, quite expertly. Uh, I am uh, simply trying to take a minute to say, I think it was very well done under difficult circumstances. That said, I find myself uh, largely in agreement with Supervisor uh, Ellenberg's uh, take on this. And, you know, one of the things I have so appreciated about working with this board is our ability to have these conversations respectfully, even when there's a different take on things. Uh, But I think we all know that uh, this is a largely symbolic gesture. That being said, symbols can be important. Uh, We are trying, I think, by our action to make a statement. 
And I guess my reaction consistent with Supervisor Ellenberg's comments is, if we're going to make a statement, then let's make it. Let's not be tepid about it. Let's not be anything other than absolutely clear that the aggression we see on the other side of the world simply cannot stand. And the way uh, nations uh, of goodwill across the globe have responded to this is by isolating the government of Russia and simply saying, this is not uh, subject to debate. It's not subject to compromise. It is wrong. It is evil. And it will not be tolerated by civilized nations and civilized people around the world. So what I want to do is um, move approval of the staff recommendation today, which does in fact terminate any government to government relationship to the limited extent we have the ability to send a message. I think that is the clearest unambiguous way to send that message. I think the administration, as I suggested earlier, has done a nice job of uh, allowing for the continued operation of the commission. If uh, this action poses a problem for sister cities, uh, then um, perhaps that's a problem they should be confronting. And if it um, poses a, an impediment to uh, accessing grants for good works, then perhaps uh, the criteria should be reconsidered. But anything less than a full-blown and immediate denunciation by virtue of a clear statement will only be misconstrued, misrepresented, and misused uh, by those who are hoping that people of goodwill will look the other way. So my motion is to approve the staff recommendation, uh, and I would ask for a second. Okay, so we've got a motion. Mr. Ellenberg is seconding. Um, I do have a comment here. Sura Smidian, if you go to package, to agenda item 35 under recommended action, possible action A, the first, I'll say sentence that ends in a semicolon, adopt resolution condemning all actions by the Russian government against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, period. And delete the rest. What do you think of that? I think that it is inadequate because the rest of the sentence is terminating the sister county relationship between the county of Santa Clara and the governments of the region of Moscow and Moscow City. And I think that that termination is a critical part of the statement. I, okay. I, don't, I don't think we, who we choose to partner with sends a very clear message about whether or not we deem them to be acceptable partners. Okay. I, don't, I don't think we do. All right, Supervisor, I'll give one more try. On possible action A, have, delete the word in the second line, delete the words sister county. So the sentence reads, adopt resolution condemning all actions by the Russian government against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, terminating the relationship between the county of Santa Clara and the governments of the region of Moscow and Moscow City. I'm gonna be very direct with you, Supervisor. Would that get you to yes on my motion? Oh, yes. All right, then Then I, I could uh, accept that because, but candidly, Supervisor, if we're terminating the relationship and the only relationship we have is a sister county one, <laughs> I, th I think the, dis the distinction is okay. semantic. But I, I take your point that you don't want to implicitly um, cast aspersions on the sister city, sister county organization or function. And uh, in an abundance of comedy, I would accept that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. And I think you were with me the last time the Moscow County, sister county group came here and meeting those, those people and they were teachers and businessmen and everywhere else. So 
I, I thank you, Supervisor, if that's okay with you, and Vice President Ellenberg, if that's okay with you. And just, Mr. Chairman, if I may, to follow up on your comment and to finish my remarks before we hear from the public, I, I, I want it to be clear how much I value this work. I think it's, it's largely uh, unseen and uh, underappreciated. I believe in the importance and value of people-to-people -people exchanges. I believe in uh, the importance of delegations of visitors going from uh, our country to uh, other countries uh, and for visitors to come here. I think we are all better served when members of the public and certainly elected officials have a broader worldview rather than a narrower worldview. That is how we build understanding. Uh, but this is a uh, an extraordinary, if not unique case. And that's why I think it uh, compels uh, action that is uh, unambiguous uh, and crystal clear about uh, the concern uh, that we all have. And I know that concern is shared across our board. So yes, thanks. it certainly is. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Lee, before I go to you, James, is there any problem with that modification? Because I certainly want to condemn the actions of the Russian government. And I know my peers feel the same way. Um, I want to make that clear and no ambiguity. What Supervisor Smidian said was, was very true. So it, it would good. be easy to strike those two, those two words from the second clause of the title of the resolution. That's what I understood you to be requested. And put a period after Moscow City. The, the governments of the region of Moscow and Moscow City, period. The, that final clause is necessary to effectuate the content of the resolution. The delegation of authority? Right. Mr. Chairman, I know that uh, through the chair, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I know that that language has been construed and I would argue misunderstood as giving the county council far greater, excuse me, the uh, county uh, executive far greater authority than uh, I believe it actually does. I think we might, um, uh, refine the language slightly by saying and delegating administrative authority to the county executive to take any and all actions uh, to terminate the and then strike sister county yep. the relationship. Then it's clear again we have not thrown a thrown a sharp elbow at the sister county system, which I don't think we want to do. We've also indicated that it's simply the administrative actions as opposed to any policy making functions. Thank you. I I'm in agreement with that if the seconder is in agreement with that as well. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Supervisor Lee, you had your hand up first, then Supervisor Chavez. Yes, no, thank you. I just want to clarify what the motion is. Uh, so what we have now is we are striking the two words sister county in the second line. So it's becoming terminating the relationship between the county of Santa Clara and the governments of region of Moscow and Moscow City. And? And, oh, are we going to go, okay. And delegating authority to the county executive or designee to take any and all actions, period? To, ter to terminate the relationship. To terminate the relationship. And excuse me, uh, through the chair, yep. adding the words administrative between delegating and authority uh, in the last uh, part of the paragraph. And so delegating administrative authority. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption, Mr. Chairman. No, no, and, and you're all correct. What we're doing here today is simply publicly showing how we all feel about what's going on. Right. Supervisor Ellenberg and I- And we're, we're B has no change, right? I'm sorry, what? Uh, the section B is something that we'll leave, uh, is, are we leaving B alone or are we gonna take B out? Do we need amendment? Do we need amendments to the bylaws? Supervisor Smithian, do you want B out? So no, I want B to stay in, Mr. Chairman. I, okay. I, I I've tried Done. to take amendments uh, that I hope Done. would respond to concerns. Done. Take yes. I'll I'll take yes for an answer. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. How about that, Supervisor Chavez? Um. What I'd like to ask is, could we hear from the public and then I'd like to make my comments? Yes. Thank you. We have two members of the public, two minutes each, please, Nancy. Speaker is Art Cohen. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you'll have two minutes to speak. 
<clears throat> Hi, this is Art Cohen. I'm also a uh, vice chair, but I'm speaking on my, on my personal self. Um, <clears throat> the Moscow Commission does not work with the Russian Federation's federal government that's committing these atrocities and war crimes that are led by Putin. The commission primarily interfaces with open world. <clears throat> and I wanted to clarify what open world is. It's a program run by the US Congress, Congressional Office of International Leadership. And it's funded by the US federal government. Open world acts as a facilitator to sponsor delegations from Russia. I'm also, a, <clears throat> I'm also against some of the proposed original so much has changed here. I have a prepared statement, so I'm going to have to improvise, but I am against some of the proposed changes to the commission's bylaws that would hinder the commission's ability to work with open world. And that has to do with the, the sister city language, which it sounds like you're going to address. Um, the other piece I wanted to share with you <clears throat> is that I have been working personally with one of the delegates that I met in 2020 who um, is an activist in Russia. She has been arrested. She's been protesting. She has uh, been arrested one or two times. Um, I'm not going to say how I've been connecting with her because I don't, and I'm not going to provide her name, but I am going to tell you that I some of the good things that have been done as an example is the Arnold Schwarzenegger video. I was able to get that to her. She was able to get that on the Russian networks equivalent to, to Twitter. So there's there's a lot of things that can be done when you're dealing with people to people and most of the delegates that i've talked to uh, are against this war and um many of them are very scared to be against it because they do end up getting arrested and she was fined about two thousand dollars equivalent thank you very much Art. next speaker is tim quigley i am unmuting you please accept the unmute to begin speaking Mr. President, members of the Super, uh, Board of Supervisors, great to see so many of you. It's been a while. I am a, I am a former chairman of Sister Cities International. It's a U.S. NGO uh, that uh, supports some 2,600 relationships around the world. We have 68 in Russia and 45 in Ukraine. I am chairing task force for both of these. I had meetings on both of these groups previously today. The importance of what we're talking about and what I had caution you when you state that you want to send a strong symbol is to make sure that in sending your symbol, you don't have the opposite effect. You cause the opposite effect of what you want to do. We at Sister Cities International, um, as a national policy, oppose closing a vital and oftentimes last channel of communications between vulnerable and and isolated people, vulnerable Ukraine, isolated Russia. So I caution you in your actions today that you should, if you're going to make a strong statement against the government, make a positive statement about these, these strong multi, multi years of sister city people to people relationships because we are not about the government. And I'll quote you one, communication that I received just yesterday. Thank you very much, dear Tim. I appreciate your support and understanding. We are people and we are for peace. Today is a very hard time and, a, and every piece of support and friendship is important. It's easy to stop the relationship between our communities, but please don't. Don't stop our channel of friendship. It would be very sad. I encourage you strongly to think through what you're doing. I appreciate the, the sense of urgency, but make sure that it is common sense urgencies that you're doing here. And it's not easy to pick up after conflict. Thank you, Tim. Next speaker is Nancy Madison. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. I am Nancy Madison and I am the chair of the Moscow Commission. I have prepared remarks uh, to deliver today. But um, since there was such a lively conversation, I'm going to be improvising. It was a little hard to follow the path of the conversation. So I'm not quite sure exactly where this resolution is going, but there are three things that are very critical to the Moscow Commission. One is that we do not sever the relationship with the sister city organization. Let me back up just one step. 
it's very important to the Moscow Commission that we do condemn the invasion, no doubt about that. But we need to condemn it in a way that does not come back and hurt us long term. So we should not sever the relationship with sister city organization, and we should modify the ordinance language in such a way that allows us to get open world grants. That has been our primary funding mechanism and we cannot lose that. There are ways to do it, but it will take some thinking. It will take some collaboration between the county and the commission because we both bring different sets of knowledge to it. And so we really need to take a very hard look at the language that has changed in the ordinance. That's all I have to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nancy, do we have one more speaker? We do. And that is Joanne Anderson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Thank you. My name is Joanne Anderson. I was recently appointed to the Moscow Commission after witnessing for years the successful programs they have implemented and bringing pride to Santa Clara County through Sister Cities International. I am more than appalled by the leader of Russia and his horrific assault on the people of Ukraine. It is more than appropriate to condemn the war against the Ukrainians. I disagree, however, in rushing to change the Moscow Commission documents outlining its mission and areas of work that could possibly stifle their participation in Sister Cities International and being eligible to apply for the war Open World Grants. To rush through and change the Commission's rules or bylaws without a study team could end the existence of the Moscow Commission. I fear the Moscow Commission could lose its membership with Sister Cities International unless the bylaws reflect the mission of Sister Cities International and are correctly written and congruent with the body's mission. The written resolution limits the commission to art, culture, and education as areas in which it can work. That would exclude the commission from applying for open world grants in other areas such as health, where the Moscow Commission and the Santa Clara County has received national recognition for their exemplary work. The scope needs to be expanded so the commission can continue to apply for open world grants. This needs time and study for accuracy of the areas allowed. This process, process shouldn't be rushed. I implore you, please, not, please do not rush through the Moscow Commission documents wording. Instead, form a study committee, including knowledgeable sister cities commissioners, so that the wording does not prevent the commission from continuing membership in sister cities international, and very importantly, does not exclude it from applying for open world grants. It would be a disaster if rushing through the wording without reflecting on the consequences and later discovering that the commission is no longer qualified to be a member of Sister Cities International and cannot apply for the open world US congressional grants that have brought honor to Santa Clara County and the commission. Please do not rush through the wording affecting the commission today. Let a team study it in depth and bring it back for review at a meeting. I reach, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, you were speaking. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Supervisor Lee um, for your your thinking. And I and you know I'm I'm reflecting on uh, Tim Quigley as well because both of you have served in the armed forces, and I think um, you have a very important perspective, both having been on the ground um, at times of uh, strife and war and and now being here. So I, ju I just want to honor that that perspective. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I think whatever action we take today that we need to make sure that as we're talking to our own communities here in Santa Clara County, that we really are um, supporting the Ukrainian population that lives here and and the Russian population who lives here that's opposing what what um, Putin is doing. And, and that's important because we want to keep peace in, uh, in our own home while this, this is uh, going on abroad. Um, lastly, I, I wanted to say to uh, why I'm supporting what Supervisor Simanian and Supervisor Allenberg are recommending. One of the challenges that we have um, is that, that we're in a situation, I think, where the way people think about um, organizations like sister cities and sister counties is that these are agreements, by the way, between governmental entities. It's the highest governmental leader in the county signed, whenever this got founded, signed something with the highest governmental leader in, in Moscow or whatever the, the appropriate partnership is. And so because of that, it is appropriate for us to terminate the 
this formal partnership because what we're saying is is that our governments can't work with you until your government um, is is treating uh, humanity with the kind of dignity and respect we all deserve. So that's why I'm supporting this. The one um, question I, I have for staff um, is this, as it relates to the people of Ukraine, we don't have a formal relationship with a sister city or a sister county in Ukraine. And I was struck by that. Um, and I'll just tell my colleagues that as part of the National Democratic Institute, also a, a US funded um, institution, I traveled many, many years ago to Moscow and to eat Katerinburg, the sister city of, um, of uh, San Jose from Russia and to, um, and to Kiev, Kiev, I'm sorry, and taught uh, classes on how women could get more involved in public service and government. And you know what I'm struck by is that um, people on all sides are really being tortured by one leader and one bloodthirsty person who wants power. And so my question really to staff is to think a little bit about how do we maintain meaningful relationships with the people, both of our county in a really robust way so that we can keep peace in our own home and thinking very disciplined about in disciplined ways. And I think you did with Moscow um, in terms of the, the areas that you've outlined, but I think we ought to be thinking about how we create and extend a partnership with the Ukraine in a more formal way. So those are my comments. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Suraj Smitty. Thank you. I uh, I, I want to just underscore again how much value I place in the effort uh, of our commissions, but I I think the the scope of this tragedy overwhelms these other concerns. It's not that they aren't legitimate concerns, but they all due respect pale in comparison to the thousands of lives lost, the tens of thousands of uh, those who have been injured, the cities that lie in rubble, the 2 million plus mm -hmm. who are refugees, the 2 million plus who are displaced persons, at, at that point, it seems to me, we have to say, given the magnitude of the tragedy, these other issues will have to be um, addressed by some other means. But, uh, and, you know, I understand uh, that uh, people uh, feel that this process is rushed. I will just point out, Mr. Chair and colleagues, really it was eight years ago that the Soviet Union invaded and annexed Crimea. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, I, I suppose the notion of rushing is a function of, um, you know, when you start the clock, but it was eight years ago uh, in 2014 uh, that uh, we saw this aggression very uh, clearly. Uh, and of course, it has been uh, a very long while uh, since uh, President Putin started to mass troops along the border of Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, you know, from my standpoint, uh, we are, if anything, um, arriving uh, late on the scene. And uh, I could not in good conscience let another day go by without doing this uh, very modest uh, thing to um, uh, add our voice to the chorus of condemnation around the world. Thank you. I ask for an I vote. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. You're muted, Supervisor. Thank you. I just want to uh, clarify what the motion is. Uh, Supervisor Mini, if you would entertain my questions just to make sure we are. It felt, I actually felt like we were saying the same things uh, using different words. So let me make sure, right? The issues that's concerned about this uh, one is talk about A, we absolutely have to condemn the invasion. There's absolutely no question that we are in full agreement of that. Uh, and then the second thing we talked about is we took out the word sister county in the A, uh, which means that we are ending the relationship between the government 
but we are not ending the sister county international uh, relationship. Am I correct? Yes. Right. Okay. So that's that's uh, preserved, um, and we still have our Santa Clara County's own Moscow Sister County Commission, and that will still be uh, in existence after this. Correct. Yes. B is unchanged. Right. To your, to your point, Sister County was removed from the second sentence. Right. Just Sister County removed from the last sentence. Right. And Supervisor Simidian added in administrative in between the words delegating and authority. Right, exactly. And then finally is there was a concern regarding this open world U.S. congressional grants granting. So I would just want to make sure that uh, we, we are not affecting that. I mean, there's no change that we are voting today that would make that change, correct, Supervisor Smedian? I can't speak to the criteria of open world. I, I can say, however, that if it's funded by the United States government, I think they're going to understand the concern and that we'll be addressing this issue uh, on a, a much larger basis. And by the way, I, I believe I misspoke a moment ago and re made reference to the Soviet Union when I meant to speak of Russia. So let me just correct the record on that one before uh, uh, we get to a, a vote. But Supervisor Lee, I, I, I don't know the criteria in all honesty, uh, but I, I need to say, if the loss of grant funding is a result, then I think that's something we have to accept. Uh, I would hope and expect that the organization would uh, understand after hearing from organizations like our own that uh, they need to be mindful of the good arguments that people here today have made. But, um, you know, bluntly put, and forgive me, Mr. Chair, but since Mr. Uh, Lee asked me, you know, if the question is, should we uh, scale back our statement in order to remain eligible for grants? My answer to that would be no. Oh, no, I don't think that's the, the purpose at all. I think there is some language in the resolution as currently drafted, uh, because currently it's drafted, it talks about ending the sister county international. And I don't believe anybody right no. now is, is, is agreeing to that. So uh, I, I think we, I think we are that. saying that we will not have a sister county relationship with uh, a, an organization that is governmental uh, and that we will um, limit our own uh, sister county uh, commission to uh, items that are cultural and educational. And if the county staff wants to weigh in about how we parse that, I would welcome it. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we struck some language in an effort to be uh, a little bit more accommodating. But if we have to, if we have to terminate the relationship in, in, in order to uh, make plain that we will not partner with the uh, governmental entities or institutions, uh, fair enough, then so be it. If we can maintain the relationship while limiting the activities uh, to those that are described and consistent with the other language, I'm certainly open to that. But I'm not open to uh, the notion that um, we should curtail the, uh, or in any way compromise the nature of our statement in order to remain grant eligible, all due respect. I, I, I'm not sure. I just want to ask to make sure County Council understands where we're going on this one. James, cha changing the title. So Dr. Smith. My, my understanding, my understanding of the motion is that um, the board's approving the recommended actions and language and materials contained in the published packet with the specific edits that were proposed to the title of the resolution under 35A. Um, and that that includes terminating the formal sister county relationship between the Santa Clara County government and the region of Moscow government. Um, and if there's a way to preserve the relationship with sister uh, city international, which is the um, the, the U, I believe US based nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. then we would do so. I don't know candidly if you're still eligible to have that if you have no formal governmental partnership in place anymore. 
um, but that's something that we would look into in the implementation of the resolution. But the resolution be clear that we be terminating the governmental relationship mm -hmm. and moving forward with the other edits. I also don't know the full criteria of the um, of the grant, but um, but if the grant requires as a precondition of the formal governmental relationship that's been established, then presumably we would not be eligible. Okay, thank you for the uh, clarification. So in the meantime, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to end our participation with the sister county international per se, being a US organization, uh, and you will look into, uh, and county council, you're gonna look into uh, those criteria to see how that would might affect the uh, open world units, congressional grants, and you could let us know maybe by next meeting, how, how that would be changed. I certainly appreciate if you can come back to us on that. Thank you. All righty, Dr. Smith. Just wanted to add a few sentences. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of the grants, they are very small in nature, and <clears throat> the board could um, actually substitute county resources for those grants in the situation where the commission felt it was necessary to participate in some meeting or some other process. Um, I wouldn't let the grant issue stop you from doing whatever you'd like to it's a relatively small amount of money yep thank you good point supervised committee and your hand still raised your hand is down supervisor lee yeah, I just want to say that, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank all the commission members who spoke uh, today on this uh, important uh, issue. Uh, there is certainly no disagreement whatsoever. The atrocity that's happening in Ukraine caused by the Russian government is absolutely not tolerable. And we are all extremely uh, unified in terms of condemning that, uh, that uh, those actions of the invasion and the suffering of Ukraine. As you can see what tie I'm wearing today, I'm definitely, uh, along with the ribbon we have on our building, is showing our support for Ukraine. Um, what we are trying to do, of course, is also sending a message, uh, and that needs to be a strong message, like uh, Supervisor Smidian and Supervisor Ellenberg has said, that needs to be very clear to the Russian government, per se, that uh, this is something that is not acceptable. In the meantime, what we are trying to craft together is basically a motion and a resolution to not only say that, but also try to not to cause any collateral damage with the people to people relationship that we have maintained. And that's something that I want to make sure that that is something we will continue to, to maintain in order to hopefully, like I said, influence those who are on the ground in Moscow. Hopefully they could then uh, uh, raise up to, to the authoritarian regime and uh, stop this uh, nonsense uh, that's going on in Ukraine. So. Uh, I believe that's the spirit of this motion. And I, uh, for those reasons, I'll support it. I won't want to look forward to work with the county council to making sure the language is just right so that uh, these uh, people to people relationship would continue to uh, uh, flourish uh, among the, uh, the, the people that's been working on the commission so hard to keep our culture, our education, and all the different exchanges that has been going for so many years. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Nancy, do we have one new speaker? And Mr. Williams, you go ahead and speak first. Nancy, if you'll just confirm that's a new speaker, we I'm will. Not a new what? I'm sorry. My apologies for interrupting. It's uh, not a new speaker. Okay, then we we can't hear from people more than once. Uh, Mr. Williams, go ahead. I just wanted to clarify my based on the most recent comment from Supervisor Lee. My understanding is the board is moving forward. Would be, this, this motion is moving forward with the adoption of the resolution today with those edits. We would not be returning with um, um, with amendments. We can provide an off-agenda report with the information Supervisor Lee requested regarding the impact um, on grant eligibility. Um, and you are correct. That is the motion on the floor that's been seconded. Thank and you. the off-agenda report would be appreciated and great job with that tie, Supervisor Lee. All right, anybody else? James, your hand's still up. Did I cut you off? Nope, you're good. 
Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. 36 was handled under consent. 37 was held. 38 was held. 39 was held. 40 was held. Items removed from the consent calendar. Nancy, I don't believe there were any. Okay, then without objection or any additional comments, we're going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Recording stopped.